picture reminded me, oh, thanks for inviting me and everything. That uh, last picture invited, uh, reminded me of a notorious case of two GIs that defected to the National Liberation Front and were the bane of the Pentagon who had orders out to kill them on sight. It was a black GI and a white GI who, of course, were codenamed in the Pentagon Salt and Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, reading the leaflet, I'm kind of amazed this is the 45th uh, anniversary of the Tet Offensive. Sometimes it seems like the Tet Uprising was only yesterday. Well, to me anyway, it seems that way. What actually happened yesterday, half the time I can't remember anymore, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay. The Vietnam War was a very long war. I was in ninth grade when the first U.S. soldier was killed, Captain York. How about, that's a really useless piece of information. Deirdre's nodding her head. Do you remember his name too? <laughs> yeah. I was in ninth grade and I was 31 years old when the last two Marines died. The young people then, uh, the war just seemed endless. So I'm not going to try to analyze much of the events of those days. Uh, maybe more like uh, paint a picture of what things look like to me and others as, as those events unfolded. <coughs> On the first day of the Tet Uprising, I was brought before a military tribunal in charge under the Espionage Act of 1918 specifically causing disobedience, disloyalty, and refusal to duty among members of the armed forces. I'll tell you, it was one of the happiest days in my life. <laughs> Made even happier by the screaming headlines about the Tet Offensive in all the local newspapers. And you heard the list of all the places captured the embassy. The uh, attack on the embassy was led by the ambassador's chauffeur, his Vietnamese chauffeur. <laughs> um, as you know, the U.S. Army was and is a violent uh, anti-democratic organization divided between an upper class of officers and back then a very suppressed class of enlisted troops. Uh, during the Vietnam War, it was packed with draftees Furious, they were being asked to fight and die for something most of them didn't believe in. The American Serviceman Union was founded to harness this anger and unleash it. Now, to Tet, um, specifically, I want to mention a guy, Bob Chenoweth. Do anybody remember him? He was a among the uh, vets here. He was an ASU organizer in Hue when the National Liberation Front overran the city in January 68. He was Armed Forces radio guy in the northern part of South Vietnam, you know, good morning Vietnam kind of DJ. And uh, as the National Liberation Front got closer and closer, they, that's good night Irene, you know, they all went into the basement and just waited to be captured. And he's sitting there and Bob had a, a Vietnamese girlfriend and I remember him telling us, he said, you know, I, I, she was sitting across from me, just sitting there, and I said, son -o, I saw you yesterday. You were pacing from the front of the station to the wall, and then from the wall to the wall. He said, you were counting how many steps it was, weren't you? And you were counting how many steps it was. So you could tell the Viet Cong when they came over the wall how, what a distance it would be to our bunker. And he said, she looked at me and said, you know, Bob, you're really a nice guy, but this is my country. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, she was right too, you know. Bob said, she, she was actually right. And he ended up five years in uh, captivity. By the time of the Tet Offensive, the soldiers and sailors and Marines had come to hate their own officers more than they hated the so-called enemy. Repression in the military was very harsh. You saw about Mitch Smith. Uh, he got six months in prison for not saluting an officer. 
and that was kind of typical. Harvey and Daniels joined, showed them, uh, just for saying the war was racist. And they were convicted under the Espionage Act too. I remember reading the trial transcript, and the presiding judge said, well, you know, what, what I believe is right or wrong in my country. I don't know about this free speech stuff, but you know. Uh, just absolute kangaroo courts. I'm just trying to remember very, uh, individual cases. Ken Stoldy and Dan Amick, right? They got four years in prison just for handing out anti-war leaflets uh, at Fort Ord. Right. Union. Union. Oh, yeah. They were ASU leaflets. Um, it's kind of shocking to recall now how radicalized the troops had become in those days. I mean, looking back, I can hardly believe it myself. I'll give an example. <coughs> Comrade Deirdre had given me a ring, and the ring was made from the first airplane shot down over Vietnam by the Vietnamese. She had gotten it in Prague, I think, when she met with the Vietnamese there. And it had the date, such, such 64, something like that, the date it was shot down. So that was my ring, and I'm a soldier in the army. <laughs> and they have reveille in the morning. You get up very early, you stand in ranks, it's dark. I reach down, oh my God, where's the ring? And I had shown all the soldiers my ring. I said, this was made from the first US airplane shot down in Vietnam. So I said, where's my ring? And the guy said, well, what happened? I said, I lost my ring. So there's these 40 guys. They say, Stapp lost his ring. You know, the one made from the... So they're all crawling around on the ground <laughs> trying to find my ring. <laughs> that seemed kind of normal. I, yeah, they're going to help me. But looking back on it, you know. In the barracks. Did you find it? Yeah. <laughs> the barracks just blasting Phil Oak songs day and night with these demoralized sergeants walking around shaking their head. <laughs> As the population at home turned against the war, the soldiers joined in and became even more militant than the civilians. And the soldiers were armed. Uh, a whole military base with 40,000 GIs ordered confined to barracks on payday, no less. Can you imagine? This is once a month you get paid. They, could, they couldn't get out and get their checks. Confined to barracks because the brass was afraid they would rebel in support of an anti-war GI being court-martialed that day. And they had fire hoses and machine guns on rooftops. And now the ASU's anti-war and anti-racist message was spread everywhere by the bond, which John showed. Mike Gill. Oh yes, Mike Gill was a postal, he worked for the Army Postal Service in Vietnam and made sure the bond went into every... <laughs> so that, yeah, the bond. And that's where they clip out to join the union and send your membership dues. And we used to get those things that'd be a year old because the bond just got passed from hand to hand. Uh, union chapters popped up at over 100 bases in the U.S. and abroad, in Europe and in Korea, Japan, Philippines, ships at sea, and in Vietnam, of course. By 1971, the war effort was beginning to show signs of collapse, and I remember the thing in Hawaii. It seemed hours from just chaos out there. I, uh, and you, you were there at that time. Sailors sab sabotaged ships, GIs printed and reprinted anti-war propaganda. They attended anti-war rallies in uniform. They rebelled in stockades and brigs, rioted against deployment, held sit-down strikes, refused orders to go on combat patrols, deserted by the tens of thousands. One battalion of 800 paratroopers in play coup held a mass meeting and voted out their commanding colonel. Which, by the way, you're not, you don't vote in the army. <laughs> and the army removed the guy. They were frightened, right? And then they took uh, the final inevitable step, which was killing their officers. And first it was a couple, and then a dozen, and finally hundreds. John mentioned Billy Dean Smith, who became a member of the ASU. 
He personally set some kind of record by wiping out a good portion of his chain of command, <laughs> working his way up. <laughs> right? His encore performance was in Cuba, where Fidel Castro presented him with one of those old 1959-style Marine Corps caps that were uh, worn by guerrillas fighting Batista. Um, I remember being in the ASU office one day when a former army lieutenant came in. And we didn't like officers much. You knew John Kerry. You did, went to more of those. Always putting a wet blanket on everything, you know. He was an anti-war officer. We didn't, uh, yeah, Bob Kerry, the new school guy, is just now now war criminal, right? Um, this lieutenant came in, and I think everybody was kind of a little bit rude to him, and he said, no, no, I really want to talk to you. So, okay, Louis, you can talk to us, what's going on? He said, I really want to thank you. So why do you want to thank us? He said, well, when I was deployed to Vietnam, I got this platoon, and two guys came up to me right away on the first day, and they said, Lieutenant, we want to talk to you. He said, yeah. They said, we're the ASU representatives for the platoon, and we want you to understand something. When uh, the Viet Cong are pretty dangerous, but if you leave them alone, they don't bother you. <laughs> and if we go out on a patrol, and they said the VC are 10 clicks to the right, then we go 10 clicks to the left. You understand, Lieutenant? And uh, he said, they said, if, you know, we do it that way, everything's going to be nice. So he said he thought for a while about it. He said, made sense to me, you know. <laughs> and he said, I come to thank you because uh, almost my entire platoon got back alive. <laughs> now, just three brief final observations. And that is the black and Latin soldiers were always at the forefront of this struggle. And the uh, women were only 2% of the military back then. They played a key role as well. Uh, women in the military like Susan Schnall, who was a, she actually was an officer, but that's because she was a nurse. They automat, they automat, if you're an RM, you automatically got officer's rank. She was an army nurse and she flew a small airplane over the Presidio base and dumped thousands of leaflets on it, anti-war leaflets. And then there were the women from the outside, which you saw the picture of 7,000 of them. That was a woman's march on Fort Dix to support anti-war soldiers, which were John Lewis there and Terry Klug and some others. Some of those people at your trial, though, did get three years in prison, right? The mass trial of the... Uh, I don't think they got three years. They, they, they did go to Leavenworth. They went to Leavenworth, right, and they probably got out. Terry had been in Leavenworth and then uh, was acquitted at that trial for reasons John said that people wouldn't testify. And there, of course, there were also women in the ASU leadership like Joyce. And the last point I want to make is um, socialists and Marxists and communists have been in the center of every important uh, progressive movement from trade unions to civil rights, anti-war campaigns, women's emancipation, gay equality, and this was certainly true of the ASU as well. So I want to stop there, and maybe some of the people that took part in that who were in the military then want to say something with you. Yeah, go ahead.